You should have received a sermon outline to help you follow along, but there will be um, verses on the screen as well. And so as we go through this, um, you know, we finished, just finished our a, a sermon on a sermon series of 20 sermons through the Sermon on the Mount. And now I want to talk to you about something that I've struggled with uh, when I first became a believer. And that is giving. This is uh, the, the first time that as your pastor, we don't normally talk about money. I know that's the reputation of the church. I know the church is always talking about money. But um, uh, as your pastor, this is the first sermon that I'm talking about uh, money. And I'm, I, even in this sermon, I'm not going to tell you what you should give or what you can give. In fact, on the back of your sermon outline is a huge list of things you can give that don't cost you anything. Okay? And so I, I just, um, I, I've always struggled with this idea. In fact, when I knew that I was called to ministry, here's what I thought. Well, I'm giving my life to ministry. I don't need to give anymore. Right? That, that I don't need to give a certain amount and I don't need to do, do something here. And yet, God has uh, reversed my ideas because I, the more I get closer to Jesus, the more I realize He wants to use me in this area. Yeah, amen. See, Jesus has uncommon sense. Right? He, he's said some things that, that are, are outstandingly weird. Uh, like, for example, he said, the last are going to be... First, right? He said, um, he said that sinners, not just the priests in the Levi class, but sinners can serve a holy God. He said that um, to gain your life, you got to lose it, right? It's almost like reverse of these things. And the way to freedom for yourself, like if you really want freedom for yourself, is actually to forgive those who hurt you the worst. That, those are things that, that are revolutionary and, and are completely opposite of what we're taught. And so Jesus comes along and says in this area of life that if you're a follower of me, I really do believe, he wants you to be a generous at person. What does that mean? You know, I do couple counseling sometimes, and one of the things I get to is I say, hey, what are, um, uh, if you were to, as a couple, how are you going to handle your finances, right? And one of the things we say, you know, don't have separate accounts because you should be, where, where Jesus said where your treasure is, right? There is your heart. And so if your treasure is together, your heart's together, those kind of things. Um, but, but, and people do it different ways. I'm not saying one way is better than the other. This is the things I think Jesus is talking about. But um, here's the deal, is that w one of the things, is that as a couple, in two years' time, when you're growing as a family, right, how will people know you're generous? Because I think generosity is something we all want to do. Generosity is something that we all want to be part of. So, so I, I find it interesting that Jesus wants us to talk about generosity, what's going on in your heart and heart attitude, more than deciding what amount you should give. Okay? So, when I talk about the generous life, I think we should start with what Jesus said. And here's what's amazing. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John do not mention this. But here, it, the Dr. Luke in the book of Acts, which is a book that afterwards says this, remembers the words of the Lord Jesus because he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Well, where do you say that? I can't find it in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's part of that extra stuff that Jesus said, right? But yet it is in the Word of God. And I think there are two kinds of people, right, usually in, in the world. And I think there's the givers, those who are generous, and those who are selfish. In fact, why don't we do this? I want all the selfish people to sit over on this side, right? And all the generous people sit. Can we do that? No. That would be silly, right? Because we would all run to the generous side. First off, no, we don't want anybody to believe we're selfish, right? Right? But the other thing is uh, the, the, that we all think that about ourselves. But the fact is, is that the Bible talks about money almost more than any other subject. Think, think about it. There's 500 verses in the Bible on faith. There's 370 verses on loving other people. Right? And there's 270 verses on prayer. But there's more than 2,000 verses on money and possessions and how you should handle it. I think God has a message for us, right? In fact, I think that during this crazy time when you've got politicians say, give to my campaign, and you have uh, these, these things that are saying, hey, why don't you give to this and, 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 and give to that and give to this, that I think that Christians want a word from their pastor about this issue of life. 
I do think that, that God is working in you. And he's given you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. Notice that. He's not just giving you power to do it. He's changing your heart. Because some of us don't want to deal with this subject. Some of us think, well, well, well you know, the church, we, we shouldn't really talk about it. No, we should. Because God has given you the desire. He's changing your heart to deal with this. And I really do believe that living generously is not like living in a world of the game of Monopoly. You know Monopoly, right? Um, I always beat my kids in Monopoly. It's great. I, I just uh, whoop up on them. I take all their money at the end of the game, right? And whoever has the most money at the end of the game wins, right? That's Monopoly. A lot of people are living life like that. Actually, I think Jesus comes along and says, I don't want you to play like Monopoly. What I want you to do is play like Uno, you know what the game of Uno is? That you give, the person who gives away all of his cards is the one who wins. And so some of us are on this monopoly train when Jesus wants us to be on this Uno way. You know, if you are playing so that all, you can get everything yourself, I think you're playing the wrong game. And so Jesus tells us, particularly, remember, it is more blessed to give Put to give away your cards than to receive. How does that work? Well, let me first say this. I think there are five ways that works. There are five things that challenged my life. And the first is this. I always think that when it comes to grand gestures, that's the way God wants me to give. But that's not true. First and foremost, God wants us to realize that small gifts offer peace. Many preachers are scared to use the word prosperity when it comes to giving. Because there's a false teaching out there called the prosperity gospel. Prosperity gospel, right? It says this, because you're in Jesus, you have the power, and if you visualize it, you can achieve it, right? If you call it out, then you can receive it, right? If you name it, then you can claim it, right? And if I give a seed money, I can expect a reward back because it'll grow, right? Let me tell you what that, what that biblically speaking is. That's malarkey. That is balderdash, that is foolishness, that is drivel, that is nonsense and hogwash. There are some times you give, there are some months that you'll give, give an offering that costs you a lot of money and you will not receive a financial reward. Instead, you'll see a children's ministry bloom. Right? So the blessing isn't financial that you get back. Right? So small gifts offer you peace, not necessarily a seed reward. If God wants to do that, hey, praise Him, right? But sometimes small gifts will just show, you know what? I am going to give even when I don't have enough to give. Because here's the thing. Some of us are, are like that financially. We don't have a lot. Maybe we're starting a family. Maybe we're, we're in uh, retirement, the, both ends of the spectrum. And you're like, I, I don't know if I can give anything. But let me tell you, when you decide to give, and it's a sacrifice, even if it's small, do you, do you know why people hang pictures of dolphins that look like aliens on their refrigerator? Because their children gave them a picture drawn from crayons uh, to hang on the refrigerator, right? It's a small little gift that their child gave them, and it's an ugly dolphin. But mama's like, this is so beautiful, thank you, right? It's a small gift, and what does that do? It offers peace. That's why Proverbs 11.25 says, A generous person will be enriched, and the one who gives a drink of water will receive water. So small gifts offer peace. But also, Jesus has taught me that secret giving removes pride. I mean, Jesus is blunt sometimes. We read, we read in, through the Sermon on the Mount, and he said this, Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. In Matthew 6, 1 through 4, right? Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father in heaven. So whenever you give to the poor, don't sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be applauded by people. Truly, I tell you, they have their reward. But when you give to the poor, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. 
I mean, that's the fact that th Jesus wants us to take the pride out of it. That's why I, I, I understand when people put plaques on something that they give out of honor for somebody. I understand that. I do. But I have a hard time when people want to make sure that when they give $1,000 that they're in charge of how that $1,000 is spent. I have a hard time when someone says, you know what, I, I, I could just pull my money and then, then how, what are you going to do then, preacher? Well, if I have to get a job for this church, I will, right? If I, if I have, well, I have a job for this church. I mean, a, a job outside the church, I will because I want us to grow. See, secret giving means that I'm wrestling with my heart. It means that I'm not giving out of pride, right? Because if you're, if you're not facing financial difficulty, you better thank God right now. Right? You are blessed. Don't take it for granted because everyone here knows someone who's facing financial difficulty. And God is not calling you to irresponsibility. He's not calling you to, to give extravagantly when you can't, but He is calling you maybe to think about how much you spend at scooters every week. Right? And go get that extra coffee. And he's, uh, he is calling you to think about how much you, you spend on your hobbies. And consider how much you give when it comes to, to buying your kids that extra clothes and there's various forms of entertainment. We're all guilty of it. But the fact of the matter is, each person should do as he has decided in his heart. Not reluctantly or out of compulsion since God loves a cheerful giver. Well, small gifts offer peace. Secret giving removes pride. And spur of the moment giving brings pleasure. I mean, God does not want all of our giving to be so planned that we no longer need to trust Him in His Word. Right? I know some people who are, who are just tithe givers. I mean, they are strict to, to lay out, I'm going to give, I actually make a thousand bucks a week, so this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to give a hundred dollars to the church. I tithe 10% of my income to the church. And that's a great standard. But that's not required ever in the New Testament. It's a standard for you to live up to. It. In fact, that should be the base of what you give. You should be able to give more. Not out of compulsion or obligation, but because God has said, Jesus even said, hey, you, you, you tithe your mints, right? Uh, uh, and you tithe the, 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 the things that, that are out there um, uh, the, in your household. But you don't do the things of justice. You should not neglect the weighty matters just so that you can tithe. I know some tithers who won't tip their waitress. I find that weird. Like, why in the world are you tithing at church and not tipping your waitress? How is that a, a good, a good way, uh, witness to things? And see, I believe the point is this. The person who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And the person who sows generously will also reap generously. So, I tithe. My wife tithes, right? We give 10%. Many people have been blessed. Why? Because I want the blessing of God in my life. But I don't do it because it's a rule, an obligation. I do it because God's in it. I do it because God wants me to be a person who is generous, who sows all out there so that I can reap generously. And here the fact is, I look at this verse, and look, does this say at church anywhere? The person who sows sparingly at church will also reap sparingly. And the person who sows generously at church will also reap generously. Does it say that? No, that means in all areas of your life, this is the way you should be. Be generous to your waitresses. She's probably having a bad day because church people showed up on Sunday and overwhelmed her tables, right? <laughs> Being so legalistic about giving means that you will miss out on opportunities to share your faith. In Luke 19, somebody's life changed. In Luke 19, there was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. He climbed up on a sycamore tree, right, for the Lord he wanted to see, right? There was a man named Zacchaeus, and, and you probably remember that from the Bible songs back in the day, right? But this, in Luke chapter 19, the story is he met Jesus, and his life completely changed. He was a rich dude. He got rich, though, off of taxing uh, people who were around him. He would go into his neighborhood's neighborhood and he would look at his neighbor's house and say, okay, well, you owe the government this much. I'll add on my surcharge and I'll make money that way. Well, look what happened to him. Because all of a sudden, because Jesus changed his heart, Zacchaeus just stood there. 
a little stunned. He stammered apologetically. Master, I give away... I give away half my income to the poor. And if I'm caught cheating, I'll pay four times the damages. All of a sudden, his heart changed because God moved on his life. And sometimes when it comes to your finances, you're down, you want that uh, hamburger at McDonald's, and for some reason it's now, what, $7 for a hamburger at McDonald's, right? And, and you're like, man, I, I don't, I, that's all I got in my pocket. But man, God's moving me to do something with this, and I needed to give it to that person I saw earlier. And if God changes your heart, let me tell you, let me tell you, when He moves and that spur of the moment giving happens upon you, that brings pleasure to Jesus. More so, more so than someone who is, is a stickler to all the rules. Because we have been set free for freedom's sake. And let me tell you this. I was born in a trailer, right? My dad couldn't keep a job. In fact, I buried my dad from a drug overdose, right? We were poor after poor. My mom, uh, we, at some point in time, my mom uh, couldn't even uh, take care of bills. We had to move in with grandma, okay? And that's the life I lived. And then in 1998, I was convicted of this, that my heart wasn't really into giving because I was just trying to survive. And I started to tithe. And you know, I've been through all kinds of things. But one thing I've never done, because God has blessed me through the tithe, because my heart was, I gotta give this. My heart was that I have never gone hungry. I have never gone where I couldn't eventually meet my, all my bills. It might take me a little bit. I might not always have my rent on time right, during those years, but, but at least uh, two, I was never more than two weeks late. And, and God had continually blessed me because I decided from my heart to give a tithe, not because I, my arms were twisted. And I believe that God is calling you to do the same. I believe that God wants you to think about those times when you give a small gift, when you give a secret gift, when you give a spur-of-the-moment gift. Let me tell you, if you decide to step up, watch how God blesses you. Because here's the thing. Stewarded giving reflects priorities. You know what a steward is? A steward is not an airplane uh, attendant, okay? Uh, well, it is, but not, I mean, that's not what I'm talking about, okay? I'm not talking about flying around in airplanes. A steward of giving is someone who takes care of someone else's money. A steward is someone who says, here's all your property and I'll take care of that. And some of you need to realize that once you placed your faith in Jesus, you became a steward. And it's the money sitting in your checking account. And you might say, whoa, wait, 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 pastor. Ain't that my money? That, yeah, God gave it to you, right? But if you're a Christian, you first realize it's not just your money, it's God's money. Because God owns everything. You have said, Lord, take over. So some of us are really easy about, hey, I want to take Jesus as my Savior, but we're having a hard time taking Jesus as our Lord. Right? Because we want him to say, hey, listen, God owns everything. So that means the money sitting in my checking account is God's. And I'm going to just taking care of his stuff. No one should be able to come in and take it from you. You are the steward of how you're going to handle that. You have the freedom to handle it the way you want. But also, I believe, a steward plans ahead. Here's what it says in 2 Corinthians 8, 7. Now as you excel in everything, in faith, speech, knowledge, and in all diligence, and in your love for us, excel also in this act of grace. He was just talking about giving. Can any of you say the following? I have a plan, and it shows that my priorities with my finances are in line with God's desires. Can you really say that? Because that's what it's about. It's not about me checking, because honestly, I don't check who's given what, right? What I'm really saying here is this. Why are we giving? Is it because God told us to? Or is it because, you know what, that's just what we always do? I mean, let's be honest. Hebrews 13, 6, don't neglect to do what is good and to share, for God is pleased with such sacrifices. But our priorities are often wrong off. 
I mean, think about it. Some of us love to live a lukewarm life. And one of the first areas that I could tell if someone is, is going to leave the church or, or, or make changes in their lives where they're no longer part of us is in this area of giving. They were giving faithfully and all of a sudden they stopped. Some of us, though, we don't give because we're different from how we show up on Sunday than how we are on other days. And some of us are just stuck. You're like, Pastor, if you just knew my financial situation, I, I don't even know how to get out of this. Let me tell you something. There are things in your life that you're paying for that maybe just don't matter. Many of you uh, go on family vacations, and I think it's great. So let me give you a suggestion for a brand new family vacation, okay? Go down to the local dump. What town is it in, Gary? Marissa, go take your whole family, take the kids, the grandkids. To, it's cheaper than Disneyland, right? Go, go down to Marissa. Your little boys are going to love it because there are a whole bunch of things sticking out and they can go, right? Go and go, look at that pile of treasure that was once Christmas gifts and was once family things that is just sitting there in the ground. And then you'll notice that all this stuff that I worry about, whether or not my kids have enough Christmas gifts and whether or not this is coming up, really, really is not, it really doesn't matter. And I want things that matter. I mean, it's good that my son can have new shoes. It's good that we can figure out how to have a car for, our, uh, uh, for when someone learns how to drive, right? It's good that we can pay for college. It's good for all these things. And that's what God wants us to, because we need to give to our family first. But why are you giving here? Like, why do you tithe? Some of you are faithful in tithing, right? And, and, and you get uncomfortable when I say it's not a requirement. I, I understand that. Right? But I'm, not, I'm saying it's more than a requirement. This is something you get to do. Not something you have to do and you're twisted to do. And sometimes, though, I'll be honest with you, right? I look at a tithing and I'm thinking, Ugh, I'm already giving this, this, and this. Do I want to? That's when I need to check my heart. Because our church is here to spread the news. To nurture believers, to evangelize the lost, to worship Jesus, and to serve the world. And that is better than anything I could give to. Right? Because worship takes money. Discipleship takes money. Ministry to kids and the next gen will take money. Reaching people is going to take money. Fellowship takes money. Um, it's unfortunate. It's not just a spiritual thing. It takes money. And this is my church. I want to give to it. Right? That's why I listen to 1 Corinthians 16 too. On the first day of the week, each of you set aside and save in keeping with how he is prospering. How has God prospered you? How has God given you such great things, right? So that no collection will come to be made when I come. And here Paul says to us, give so that no, we won't need extra things. And that's beautiful. Because bottom line is, sacrificial giving shows passion. Sometimes our giving can become really extravagant because it comes from our heart. And when our heart enters the picture, watch out. You know what's beautiful is that the Bible doesn't just paint men as examples, but sometimes it paints women uh, as examples as well. Not just sometimes, but often. The, 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 do you read through the book of Acts, it was the, the women of the towns that would support the ministry of Paul. It would, it would be the missionaries that were supported by women. And here Jesus, coming up to his last days, was astoundingly supported by Mary. I don't know if you know about her, but we probably feel uncomfortable with her in the church. She was a woman of ill repute. She, if you don't know what that is, ask your grandma. In John 12, 3, though, it says this. Mary took a pound of perfume, pure and expensive nard, anointed Jesus' feet, and wiped his feet with her hair. So the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Let me tell you, this... this jar of nard was probably worth a salary of blue collar worker a year's a year's salary of a blue collar worker so she poured out about $35,000 worth of stuff in today's parlance right $40,000 laid out at his feet why why would she spend that kind of money because she wanted to give it all to Jesus and i'm going to tell you the bible connects your generosity with your heart i mean 
The reason we have discussions about this is because we need to check our heart. Romans 12 says this, Do not lack in diligence and zeal. Be fervent in the Spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in affliction. Be persistent in prayer. Share with the saints in their needs and pursue hospitality. People should be welcomed here. We don't need to talk about money every week. But we do need to check our heart at the door and say, all right, am I being generous? Because Jesus has been generous to me. In fact, let me put it more bluntly. I don't think you can be spiritually mature without giving on a regular basis. I, I just don't. I don't think unless that's part of your life that you've said, here's Jesus, and then all of my finances are over here, and I'm going to leave that alone from him. Jesus wants it all. He wants you because he has a better plan for you. I believe that Jesus can handle your money better than you can. Amen. I mean, ask yourself, really, ask yourself, how much should you give to show that you're living a generous life? I think the tithe is a great start. But I believe that if you've never given to the church on a regular basis, then you should start by making baby steps. Take baby steps. 10% is a lot for some. We can't get there. Maybe when you look at your finances, you realize that, well, I can't do that right now. But what you say is, from my heart, I can start with maybe 4%. Start there. Figure it out. Whatever percentage you give, you can give on a regular basis. And then this time next year, give more, one more percent. It's easier to jump from $100 a week to maybe $120 a week and then rather than uh, starting out at $2,000 a week. You know what I mean? The fact of the matter is start with baby steps and then increase it as you steward God's plan for your finances. We have people once a month coming into our missions and sharing what they're doing. And the, word, the world says that, you know what, if they're going to Spain, let them take care of it. If they're going to uh, Germany, let, to, let them take care of it. But if you're passionate about the love of Christ reaching these people, start with your heart. Give. Because Christ gave to you. I mean, think about everything he gave. He could have been a millionaire, a billionaire, all these things. Instead, he said, I don't even have a home to lay my head down in. He could have, he was so brilliant, he could have started college educations and, and brought people in around the world. Instead, what he said, you know, I'm going to take these ragtag group of poor people and, and send them around the world. This Jesus, who had everything, gave up everything, and he deserves our treasure. And I want others to know about him. I want the next generation of Mascuda to have a Bible-believing, spirit-filled church. I want you to know the life of generosity, too. Because I got to tell you, doing good, being rich in helping others, being extravagantly generous. Look at the promise. If they do that, they'll build a treasury that will last, gaining life that is truly life. Why do I want a generous life for you? It's not because I want your money. Honestly, if you think that, just keep coming to church and don't give a dime. I, it, it, that's up to you. But those of you who are on fire for the Lord, I want you to catch this generosity. Because God wants this. He wants you to build a treasure that will last, gaining life that is truly life. Because the question when I give is not how much should I give. The question I want to give, it, it, to really ask is this. What's God going to do? Yes. Right? Who's going to get saved because we gave this? What mission is, gets to sin around the world because we gave this? What ministry gets started here? I mean, if we are going to start a children's ministry, right? We need generosity to spring up out of the people so that we can find somebody to do this for us, right? We, we, we know we have a faithful God. And so when God does something, the, me giving says, God, I am trusting as you're faithful. Yes. This is my church, and I want to build something great here. But more importantly, God, I know you have called us to support it with generosity. See, here's the thing. I think that some people don't give to the church because they're playing religion. They're playing by the rules. Because Jesus really did say, 
For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Right? So if you're playing with religion, your heart's not in it. So you don't give. You even have a problem with giving. Right? But what, if your heart's in it, if you are like, man, I love this Jesus. And, and my church might be quirky, and the pastor might be wearing a weird shirt, and all these crazy things, right? But let me tell you, I love this place because I found a family here. Amen. And my heart's here. Amen. So, some of us have the second part of that verse right, that our heart's here. But when is the first part going to come true? For where my treasure is, there my heart will be also. Jesus told us over and over that there's a connection between the generous life and blessing and me really believing. 2 Corinthians 9.13 says this, because of the proof provided by this ministry, because they gave, they will glorify God for your obedient confession to the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone. See, when you realize that Jesus has come and he has said, man, he's changed everything. So I'm going to even give support so that more people can know. All of a sudden, look what happens. Your giving becomes a confession. Your giving becomes proof. Your giving becomes this, this generosity that everyone gets to hear Jesus is alive. Amen. Back in the day, the church was guilty of supporting um, some false things. One of the things that the church really railed against was this idea that the sun um, went around the earth, right? They would say, no, 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 that, 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 that the, the, the sun, the earth, no, I got that backwards. They, they would rail against this idea that the uh, sun goes around the earth and they would take anyone who believes something different. Ptolemy taught that the, the, the earth was the center of everything. Right? And that the stars and the space and the sun uh, revolved around it. And then this guy named Copernicus come along. And he looked up and did some calculations. And he said, no, wait a second. We're revolving around the sun. And the sun is moving around in his face. And it started a revolution. Right? And I think we need a shift too. When it comes to this topic of, of generosity, some of us need a revolution that might take generations to fix. Where we used to say, everything revolves around me. Everything revolves around me. Then you come to the point where you met Jesus and you realize, nah, everything revolves around the sun. My finances need to reflect that. That it's not about me. It, if your kids, if your grandkids saw your giving, if your wife, your, your, your husband saw your giving, would they say that your finances revolve around you? Or would they say there's been a revolution? It revolves around Jesus. Because that's what the generous life is about. This is a new allegiance that leads to a giving heart. And I got to tell you, today I want the generous life for you. Because I believe that God is going to do a great thing and is doing good things. And look at the around us as, as we continue to grow. Look at the hearts that are changing. Look how people are coming to the Lord. And look at that revolution that can happen in people's lives. I believe that as we come to the altar and to this time, I'm going to ask you to do this one thing. We're, we're going to have the, the singers come, and they're going to sing us a, a song. And, um, and as we do that, we're going to prepare our hearts for communion. And what I would like you to do is on the back of that sermon illustration, uh, on that sermon outline, there's a whole sheet that says um, gifts that you can give to God. And many of them have nothing to do with finances. Because generosity doesn't start with a wallet. It starts with your heart. And then you can move and do great things. You giving means that you need to be a person who's generous with your time and your treasure and your effort, your life, your passions. Because Jesus was passionate for you. 
And what I'm going to do, can I have your microphone? Well, as the piano plays, I'm going to take a stop for a moment, and I'm going to ask Deacon George to read a devotional as we prepare our hearts to encounter this generous God. See, Jesus, in his generosity, died on the cross for our sins. And so, as we think about our lives, and as we come to this point in communion, we too need to be a people who stop and consider, Lord, what are you calling me to? What are you doing? What is, what is, God, what do you want from me? And by me giving you my heart, Lord, what are you going to do? God loves you so much. Brother George, would you please read that devotion? The title of this reading is Let There Be Light. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty eight indicates that one of the primary purposes of communion is self-examination. When we complete this objective with the realization that God is light, that's in 1 John 1, 5, we have the perfect combination to genuinely, genuinely see ourselves. Since the New Testament often warns us about self-deception, the Lord's Supper provides the optimum time to align with the, the psalmist who said, Search me, O God, and know my heart. And also the light of God is an interesting aspect of his character. The good news is that light helps us to see. The bad news is that light helps us to see. It's not really bad news, it's more like painful news because light exposes our blemishes. I suspect all of us have the experience of sitting in our houses and watching the bright sunlight blaze through a window. There are many things you can see that were visible, invisible on a cloudy day. Dust particles, streaks on the window, and water spots on the supposed supposedly clean drinking glass all of a sudden become very apparent. This is the challenge of courageously living in the presence of God's light. We become more aware of our spiritual contaminants. Jesus immediately recognized this in his earthly ministry. In John chapter 3 verse 19 he said, This is the verdict. Light has come into the world. But men love the darkness better because their deeds were evil. This exposure can feel so threatening that we spend years of our lives hiding from the truth about ourselves. Like our ancient father Adam, we become skittish souls always on the lookout for a more adequate brand of fig leaves rather than acknowledging the destructiveness of our rageful discharges, we don the fig leaf of rationalization, convincing ourselves that we would never be like that if it weren't for all the jerks around us. Rather than feeling the sting of our deceitfulness, we can push the minimize button on our computer-like brain and shrink our sin-like right out of view. This was the plight of the Pharisees when Jesus tried to reach them with the truth of the gospel. They hid behind their religious behaviors. Christ exposed them as whitewashed tombs, white and shiny on the outside, but full of corruption where it really counts. Pastoral counselors will tell you there are two kinds of people, those who spend their lives improving their hiding and deceptive skills and those who have recognized enough about God's grace to come into the light. They are willing to feel the intense pain of their deep inadequacies only because they have come to know that God loves them enough to embrace them more than all. This is where deep abiding freedom begins. Communion was designed by God to convince us to come into the light. It's painful to be exposed, but not as painful as 
leading the life of a pretender. Remember, it was a tax collector who beat his breast and cried, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner, who went home justified. The pretending Pharisee probably impressed no one but himself and other, and other imposters. This is a time God has ordained that we come into his light. And now, Lord, we ask you to help us come into your light. In Christ's name, amen and amen. 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 And is that time for us to come into the light? We're going to come and bring the emblems to you. And as we do that,